My name's Cor. I'm on the pastoral staff here at Hope. I want to welcome you. I want to uh, express my gratitude for you coming this morning. It is a joy. It's a privilege to be able to worship with God's people. And if you are new to Hope, if you're checking out church, checking out Christianity, just want to welcome you. This is a church that's designed to be a place where you can ask the big questions of faith, where you can wrestle and struggle through what you believe about God and you believe about his son, Jesus, what you believe about what we're going to talk about today, which is the cross, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and its meaning within the history of the world, within the history of the church, but more personally within your life. What does the cross of Jesus mean for you. I feel a little bit after having studied this passage this week, I was trying to identify just emotionally where I was at and trying to compare it to other points in my life. And the, the one that came back to me was actually when I saw the passion of the Christ. It's probably no surprise, but when I saw the passion of the Christ and I saw vividly in a video form and video, video illustration what happened to Jesus, what he underwent to die, to save, to be a part of God's redemption plan for humanity, that was, that, that moment ever having watched that video and coming out, and there just were, there were no words. Perhaps you've seen it and had that similar experience, you just, you come out of that movie and that experience, and there's just... There's no words to appropriately articulate, this is how I feel. This is how what I just saw moved me. There's, there's no words. And so I, I feel a little bit at a loss today because I, I wish that there were some way for me to just click through my PowerPoint and not talk. I wish there, were, there was that option as a preacher because that's, that's a little bit of how I feel this morning of like, God, what can I say? How can I appropriately articulate the value and the importance and the magnitude and the layers of depth and the deep meaning and the theology and the richness and the, the personal way that you care for each person through the cross? It's just, just know that today words escape me. It, it, it's as though somebody, if, you, if you've ever seen somebody retire, you know, after 30, 40 years, and I think this happens often at the end of people in their sports careers, and they have a microphone thrust in their face, and they just say, tell us what this last 35 years has meant to you. It's just like, they, they saw, throw out something trite, like, well, it's just been great. It's like, that's, that's what they come up with to summarize, and... And, um, and so just know that as I, I come here and I share these things, I, I feel a great inability to articulate all that I'm feeling, all that this week has meant to me as I've studied the scriptures. And so I'm going to share what Luke shares. I'm going to walk through the passage that was there when we laid out the sermon series two years ago. I'm going to walk through this passage, and it surprises me a little bit. Not that I was surprised that Jesus was going to be crucified, but I think I have heard this preached so many times where the central guiding force was Jesus dying to save sinners on the cross. It's like that's, that's, that's a huge part of why he was crucified. I've, I see the depths of theology that Jesus exchanged his life for ours, that he took our sin and we receive his righteousness. And I've heard this preached from a theological perspective. But I'm going to walk through this passage today, as Luke does, from a place of Jesus still ministering, still serving, still teaching, still responding to the crowds and to the people with grace. It's interesting to me. That in the midst of Jesus bearing his cross, he considers the interests of others as greater than himself. He's still Jesus, counting the preference and the needs of these people around him as greater than his own. And it's, it boggles my mind how he can take attention off himself to the people that are taking this scene in. We're going to see over the course of 18 verses 
seven different people, different groups that Jesus is ministering to. It's phenomenal. So we are in the Gospel of Luke. We are just a, uh, several sermons from the end. We're looking at Luke chapter 23, verses 26 to 43, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And so if you're new to hope, new to the church, this is an apt time to be here. We are looking at the focal point, the central tenet of the Christian faith, which is the cross that hangs behind me. We celebrate Christ crucified. We preach Christ crucified. There's very little that we want to add to that, you know, uh, for fear of preaching something that's a minor doctrine. The major doctrine is Christ crucified, Christ saving through the crucifixion, Christ redeeming through the crucifixion. And so we're not going to wander too far from that as that is central to our faith. And if, if we don't preach Christ, we, we, we preach novelty, and that's very, very close and on the road to heresy. And so we want to preach Christ, him crucified, and not too much more this morning. So let me read from this passage, and then we'll take some time to unpack a little bit of Jesus' ministry to those people around him. Begins in verse 26. As the soldiers led Jesus away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed Jesus, including women, who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, Do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the children, blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching. And the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Those are the verses that we're going to walk through this morning, looking at the crucifixion of Jesus. But again, Luke choosing to highlight, differently than the other gospel accounts, these interactions with others surrounding this scene. We have looked for over, you know, two years now about Jesus' ministry and his teaching and what kind of response it invokes in the crowds, in the followers, in his disciples, in the religious leaders. And here again today, we see Jesus teaching, Jesus reaching out, Jesus loving on people, and Luke chooses to highlight what is the response of the crowds What does this do to them? What does this do for them? How do they respond to the crucifixion of Jesus? He takes time to highlight that. So let's go back to the beginning here, beginning in verse 26. Now, I want to highlight the space in between verses 25 and 26. Now, why do I do that? Last week, we looked at a section of of Luke, uh, chapter 23, from verses 13 to 25, 
verse 25, ended our passage from last week, and it says this. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, Barabbas, okay, and surrendered Jesus to their will. If you remember that from last week, there's this interesting exchange that happens where Jesus is going to be crucified and given over and put in the place that Barabbas should have rightly been. But there's this interesting substitution that takes place. And then it says that Pilate surrendered Jesus to their will. Our passage from this morning then picks that up and says, as the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon. Now, if you read the other gospel accounts, there's a part that's missing from Luke's gospel. What is in that space between verses 25 and 26? Having scourged Jesus, the soldiers led him away. Having scourged him, having beat him, having whipped him with braids laced with steel or bone, they whipped him. I don't know why Luke doesn't include this. Some artists don't include this. Some artists will show Jesus depicted hanging from a cross and having a clean stomach, clean legs, only bleeding from his hands, his wrists, and his feet. Jesus will hang on the cross having been scourged, having been beaten. And so I asked myself, why doesn't Luke include that? That's an interesting piece. And this is speculation, but I I wonder why, why of all the gospel writers does he not include this? He's the doctor. He's the physician. He's the one who would know at least a little bit more than the other gospel writers what Jesus is experiencing as he's being beaten. Granted, Luke as a physician in the first century would be different than a modern day physician. What a modern day physician would know would be light years in front of Luke. But I just think of Luke, he's now writing his gospel account 40 years after having witnessed the crucifixion. So he's had time to think about the scourging, had time to think about the crucifixion, but he doesn't include it. It's almost as though, here's me with my physician's mind and the trauma that I witnessed and my ability to care for and administer some measure of healing to the person in need. And then he considers Jesus being scourged and beaten, seeing his flesh opened up. And it's as if Luke just says, I I don't have a category. I wouldn't even know the first place to start about how am I going to minister some measure of healing, some measure of care for this man. Over here, this smaller trauma, I would know, I would have some handle of wrapping what I could do, but with Jesus beating it, he doesn't even include it. It's like just such a different category. And even the crucifixion compared to the other gospel accounts is very understated. We talked about this with some of the healings. It's it's Luke takes some of this stuff that's just so enormous, seemingly just so spectacular, and he states it in just understated language. Jesus healed. Jesus calmed the storm. Sometimes Jesus does things in in Luke's gospel without even saying a word. It's just so understated. And even the crucifixion and the scourging isn't even mentioned. It's almost like there's this, this... inability to actually access what's happening with the crucifixion for Luke. It's just so monumental, so overwhelming. And, and for me, I, going back to the Passion of the Christ, there was something that, that broke inside of me when I watched that movie, and specifically the, the scene with the scourging. If you remember the scene, Jesus is shackled. He's shackled around what appeared to be a, a large boulder. And they just beat him. And I thought, okay, they're, they're preparing to unshackle him. It's over. They will now lead him away to be crucified. They unshackled one wrist basically to open him up and expose his chest and his front side. And then they continue the beating.
And I've, as I've grown closer to Jesus, I, I feel like my friendship with him has deepened over time. When I, shortly after I came to Christ, I knew him as this exalted Savior and Lord, this, this other. And as time passes, he is still that. But my friendship with him has blossomed. I feel a closeness and a richness just in our relationship, in our friendship. Okay? When I'm alone, he's there. And we have this friendship. And so it, it hurts me to think afresh on the beating that he took because of sin, because of my sin. It, it pains me as his friend to think that he went through that willingly for the joy set before him. He endures this being. For the joy set before him, he endures the cross as a friend of his. I hate that. So they beat him and they scourge him and then they lead him away to be crucified. And that's where we meet one of the first people on this journey, Simon of Cyrene. It says, as the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. So Simon from Cyrene. Where is Cyrene? This would be modern-day northeastern Libya. So you have kind of northeast Africa, okay, northeast Africa, Foremost over would be Egypt and then Libya. Northeast corner, that would be Cyrene. He would have come from what's called the Athens of Africa. Uh, one of Socrates' uh, disciples founded this city. Simon came from there, from this country area, and he's just, he's just picked. He's just grabbed from the crowd. Unwillingly and unwittingly, he needs to carry this cross of Jesus. Jesus, having been beaten, having been scourged, is without energy. Even though this was an expectation that he would carry the cross, remember, the cross beam of his cross, he can't do it. He can't make it. Soldiers recognize this and they pick Simon to carry it on his behalf. In doing so, Simon becomes an image for us of what it means to be a follower, a disciple of Jesus. Last week we talked about Barabbas that he becomes this unwitting okay, substitution. He experiences this substitution. He gets, should get crucified, he's set free. Jesus, who should get set free, gets crucified. There's this substitution that takes place. Here, Simon, unwittingly and likely unwillingly, because of the scorn and shame that the cross brings, is set forth as another image, a picture of us, of what it means to be in relationship to God. In this case, a disciple, a follower. Jesus said in different places, no servant is greater than their master. No student above their teacher. If it happened to me, it will happen to you. If I suffer, you too are going to face suffering. And so Simon carries this cross. As it says in Luke 14, 27, whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And so Simon from Cyrene carries the cross and becomes an image of what it means to follow Jesus. What do we else do we know about him? To this point, not much. We don't know what's his background. Why is he coming in from the countryside? But given the fact that we have 40 years of time passed from Jesus' crucifixion to the time that Luke writes the gospel account, life transpires and we get a word from Mark's gospel about who Simon is. Simon is none other than the father of Alexander and Rufus. And you're like, who are those guys? I don't know those names, you know? Okay? Why is this important? Why does this matter? Basically, Mark is writing to the church in Rome. Okay? He's sharing his, expect, his uh, uh, understanding of the gospel, of the life and, and, and teachings and miracles and crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And he's putting in this note for the church. Do you know who carried the cross? Do you know who it was that got grabbed from the crowd? You know who it was? Alexander's dad, Rufus's dad. That's the Simon from Cyrene, not from Waukesha, from Cyrene. That, that guy. If you want to, just go talk to Alexander and Rufus. And so some of you might be here and you doubt the words of the Bible. Could they be legitimate? This is one of those very indirect ways of saying, I think it's legit. 
Because this would be pretty easy to just go over to Alexander and Rufus and be like, is this just a bunch of malarkey? And they're like, yeah, dude, it wasn't our dad. Uh, he didn't, seems like he would have shared that story as we were sitting on his knee growing up. And he didn't, right? So this is in there, and we learn that the church would know Simon because they know Simon's sons. Seemingly, this Simon doesn't just carry the cross and give us an image of what it means to follow Jesus. I think he follows Jesus. So much so that his sons become a part of the church that receives Mark's gospel. Continuing on, we turn now from Simon to another group of people. This group identified as the daughters of Jerusalem. It says, a large number of people followed Jesus, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. Now, when it says daughters of Jerusalem, Jesus is not turning around just saying, I only want to talk to the women. I only want to talk to the females in the crowd. You men can take a time out. That's not what's going on here. This is one of the ways that in the Bible we see Jesus and other prophets speak to a group of people and identify a group of people. Basically, he's saying people of Jerusalem. Okay? Sometimes you'll see in Scripture, it will just the prophet will identify, hey, sons of Israel. That doesn't just mean, oh, this is only for the guys. Ladies, you don't need to listen. No, this is for all the people of Israel. So here too, it's people of Jerusalem. Do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. It's interesting. Okay, and this is one of those times where Jesus is going to minister to a group of people as he bears the cross, as he's heading to the cross. Boggles my mind. He says, don't weep. We're going to have to ask the question, why should they not weep for Jesus? Why should they weep for themselves? It just begs that question. That's, Jesus, you're, you're the one experiencing the pain and humiliation going to the cross. Why would we not, how can we not weep for you? He goes on to say that the time will come when you will say these words. Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nurse. So to those who are weeping and wailing, first they go, why would you tell us not to weep? And then why in the world would you say we will pronounce blessing over the childless? Throughout scripture, throughout Jewish history, those who gave birth to kids were seen to have received the favor of God and those who were childless, the seemingly lack of favor before God. And so how would it be that we would reverse these things, that you would actually say, blessed are the childless? No, 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 that blessing is to those who have children what are, what are, how are the circumstances such that that would be reversed, Jesus? So why shouldn't we weep for you? Why would we bless those who are childless? Well, verse 30, it says, Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. That's his answer. That's his response. Not very clear. Not, not easily understandable for me as I'm into this passage. Like, Jesus, I'm trying to follow your logic here. What's going on? Let me just highlight verse 31, and then I want to come back to verse 30. Verse 31, he's going to give some more rationale of, hey, if people do these things, do what things? Crucify their leader. Crucify Jesus. Crucify the coming one, the anointed one, the Messiah. If they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? A lot of speculation about this kind of proverbial statement here. If the tree is green, seems to indicate talking of Jesus being the vine, Jesus bringing forth life, and then, all right, if, if Jesus is taken from us, there's gonna be a lot of dryness, a lot of absence. Okay, not gonna go too much into that because there's way too much speculation, not enough clarity, but if they're gonna do these things to me, what's gonna happen when I'm taken from them? When there's no presence of me? All right, let's try to get our, he our heads around this. What's going on here, Okay. I need to go and grab onto a different passage, but let me highlight here his, his comment. People are going to say to the mountains, fall on us into the hills, cover us, because of what's happening here. What's happening here? What's happening here is judgment. Now, how do I get that from this expression, say to the mountains, fall on us, and the hills cover us? This is referenced a couple times in our Bibles. One is in the Old Testament, in Hosea. Okay? It's referenced here in Luke's gospel, and this, it's also referenced in the book of Revelation. Talking in the context about God's judgment, that there's been waywardness, 
there's been sin, there's been idolatry, okay? God's going to bring judgment, and the response of the people to God's judgment is, rather than face judgment, I'd rather have the mountains fall on me and the hills cover me. That would be a better, that would be better than facing God, holy God, righteous God in the face of our sin. Let me hit those two passages. Hosea 10 reads this way. The high places of wickedness will be destroyed. It is the sin of Israel. Thorns and thistles will grow up and cover their altars. Then they will say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. Okay, so there you see it. High places of wickedness being destroyed. This is the sin of Israel, and God's going to come against it and judge it such that they call to the mountains, cover us, and the hills fall on us. Let me jump to Revelation in the New Testament at the end of our Bibles. Okay, we read this from Revelation 6. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, so you just imagine all the people there, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountain. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? The wrath of the Lamb has come. Who can withstand it? Answer, no one. No one can withstand this. And in the face of that, people say, I'd rather experience this demise of having the mountains and the hills cover me. So Jesus, as he is going toward the cross, says, don't weep for me. Weep for you. There is judgment coming. There is a sentence coming. You're going to face this. Better to face this childless. To face Almighty God, holy, righteous, pure, spotless God, in your sinful state, will cause you to respond just, God, I don't want to see that. And you try to cover yourself. Kent Hughes says, the coming judgment would be so horrific that barrenness, normally held to be a reproach in Israel, would be counted a blessing. The coming judgment would be so unbearable that Israel would cry out with language used by ancient, unfaithful Israel, pleading for an earthquake to cause the mountains to fall on them and thus put them out of their misery. That was unintentional. I need like a sweat towel, but wipe my face towel. Is there any way to redeem that? Any way to get that back? So though those words were hard to understand, what is Jesus doing? As he's going to the cross, he cares enough about these people to warn them. There's something about him going to the cross that is going to help them understand the judgment of God and how it can be alleviated, how you can avoid it. So you don't have to call the mountains down upon yourself. Jesus cares enough about them at that moment to warn them. To warn us. Jesus looks to their interests and needs. Even as he's walking, scourged and beaten to the cross. What great love Jesus has for his people. Moving forward here, we see, see Jesus hung on the cross. It says, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called Golgotha, or the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. This is all of the ink that Luke spills on the crucifixion. It's understated, right? There's so much more that could be shared, and he just doesn't share it. Let me expand just a bit. I don't think we can just walk in and out of the crucifixion without taking enough time to pause and reflect on the monumental work that takes place there. Kent Hughes, I've, I've pieced together a couple of his quotes that just help us 
experience just a little bit, just have a little bit of insight into what was going on in this moment of crucifixion, Jesus hanging on the cross. The cosmic trauma had begun. There never had been such pain as physical and spiritual evil now came against Jesus in terrible conjunction. Body and soul recoiled. The initial shock of crucifixion had rendered him paralyzed and quivering. Physical disbelief screamed from severed nerves. And even greater spiritual horror closed in. He would soon become sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us. We must never fall to the delusion of thinking that Jesus' physical suffering was not as great for him because he was God. He did it as a man among men in total and exemplary dependence upon the Father. His pain was alleviated by nothing. The cross reveals excruciating pain, and excruciating love. He did this that he might uphold the glory of God and that he might extend salvation, grace, forgiveness to you and me. He willingly hung on a cross. And for me, I know my personal desire to escape pain, to just want it to be over. There's something in me that just, just hates discomfort. It's one of the, the, the false gods that I need to just uh, uh, try to repent of, just comfort, just feeling good. And here Jesus in his just height of pain, suffering, discomfort, stress, spiritual, physical, mental, emotional, he has a willingness to stay there. Now, not only this, we believe in, in Colossians chapter 1, it says in uh, verse 17 that he upholds all things. That all things hold together because of Jesus doing his work to continue to hold all things together. So it's not just that Jesus hangs on a cross that somebody else built and is holding together. Jesus holds together the cross that holds him up. He holds together steel molecules so that the spikes that were driven by through his wrists, through his hands, and through his feet uphold the properties, the physical properties of being a stake. He upholds the stake so that he can continue to hang on the cross. He upholds the properties of wood so that the wood doesn't break and give way. It's phenomenal. Jesus is crucified as the center of our faith, as the only means of salvation and alleviating the wrath and judgment and sentence of God. This is, there's no other way, friends. There is no other way. This is God's orchestrated salvation plan. Continuing on, it says, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Even as he's staked to the tree, he's thinking, Father, forgive. Father, care well for these soldiers. They have no idea what's happening. They have no idea that they're contributing to the crux, the hinge point of all human history. They have no idea. Forgive them for the role they play in this. He's ministering. He's serving. He's caring for the people who are driving this. It's phenomenal the ministry of Jesus in the midst of the crucifixion, putting their interests, their needs, above what he's feeling and experiencing. In verse 35, it says, the people stood watching. The rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself. If he is God's Messiah, the chosen one, the soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar, insulting him, and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. They speak truth. They unwittingly speak truth about Jesus, that he is the king of the Jews, that he is God's Messiah, that he is the chosen one. But they mock him. They ridicule him. They scorn him. 
It brings us to our last two that Jesus meets. It says in verse 38, there was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. The same mocking that came through the rulers and the soldiers now comes through criminal number one. Save yourself. Save us. That thing you did with Barabbas, I want that too. Interestingly, he is noted as the king of the Jews. Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, when Jesus is born, people come looking for Jesus. Where is the one who was born king of the Jews? We've come to worship him. Here is the one who was born king of the Jews being crucified, being crucified. Not because something went wrong, but because this is God's redemption brought to fruition. This is that we might worship him. Come worship the king of the Jews. Come worship the son of God, born of a woman, held up, crucified. We worship him, beginning, middle, and end. Let's turn to the second criminal. The other criminal rebuked the first criminal. Don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly. We're right to be here, not Jesus. We committed crimes worthy of capital offense, not Jesus. We are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man had done nothing wrong. Something happening in the course of them hanging on a cross where the second criminal turns turns to Jesus and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me. Don't forget about me. Save a spot for me. Help me. I need you. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise also meaning garden. Jesus seemingly putting forth this idea of the garden. Garden of Eden. Garden at creation. Just this spot where we can walk in the cool of the day with God, a place where no sin, no brokenness, no pain, no death. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Why? Because Jesus will remember him. Why? Because, guys, will you remember me with all that's happening here? You knowing that I'm rightly hanging next to you, having committed all these offenses, will you remember? Will you have mercy on me? Jesus says, I will. Copernicus, the astronomer, has been quoted as saying this. I do not ask you, God, for the grace that you gave St. Paul, not the city, the, uh, the man, uh, the biblical character, nor can I dare to ask for the grace that you granted to St. Peter, but the mercy which you did show to the dying robber, that mercy, show to me. Mercy enough to save, mercy enough to forgive, mercy enough to welcome me into paradise, into your arms. I want to ask you a few questions. Are there any characters in this story that you can identify with? Absolutely, without question, the crucifixion of Jesus is the focal point of our faith. And yet Luke paints this picture and brings all these characters flooding into this story. I've never gone through the crucifixion account with just so many conversations in my mind. It's always been Jesus, Jesus alone. And here, Jesus continues to minister to people and have interactions to express care and concern or neglect those who would mock. And so I just want to go through just... Simon, maybe you sit there this morning and you just feel under the weight of the cross. Is that you this morning? You just feel weighed down by life, relationships, responsibility, work. You just weighed down. You feel like you're just carrying this burden, this cross, this suffering. Is that you? Perhaps this morning you're in the place, in the seat of the daughters of Jerusalem.
This should serve as a warning. It is a harrowing proposition to face God on your own without His Son Jesus as your advocate, as your substitute. Is that you this morning? Would you rather have the mountains fall on you than to actually be face to face with Almighty God? Perhaps you wandered into this place, you were drugged by somebody, you got on Hope Bus, you came. And Jesus this morning is speaking words. Father, forgive them. They have no idea what they're doing with their lives. No idea how they got to church this morning. No idea about what this message is and what their needs are before you. Father, forgive them. Maybe you're in that place this morning. It'd be a great idea to receive the forgiveness that Jesus offers you. Perhaps you're just the crowd. You're the people just standing, watching, just trying to soak in all of this message and the words and the experience and the, the picture of Jesus being crucified or Maybe you're a mocker. Maybe you're here actually to store up ammunition against Christians. You don't believe in Jesus. You don't believe in the Bible. You don't believe in church. You're here simply to make a mockery of a friend, of a roommate. You position yourself the same way the rulers and the soldiers did in opposition to Jesus. Maybe you're criminal number one. Save yourself. Save me. But in doing so, you want it your way. You want the Barabbas deal, not so that you can worship Jesus, but just so you can get out from under judgment. Jesus doesn't want to just save you because you're scared of judgment or wrath or hell. Jesus wants to bring you into his family, adopt you as a son or a daughter. That you might experience a closeness and an intimacy, a friendship with him. Or maybe you're criminal number two, just calling out, remember me, God. Show me mercy. I don't need what Paul got or Peter or any of the disciples or any of the prophets. Just, just mercy that you gave that robber, that thief. And after you come to that place, ultimately I want to say, do you... Do you fear God? Do you, do you worship God? Do you honor God? Do you see God as the greatest, as the best, as foremost, and his son as savior? The hinge point of human history is the crucifixion of Jesus. The hinge point of your life is how will you respond to that? God can bring you from darkness to light, from death to life, as you turn to him. Just like the criminal on the cross, he turned to Jesus and said, have mercy on me. You can do that this morning. I want to pray for us. And we'll have a chance to sing a couple songs. Be thinking about that. Do you believe? Do you fear? Do you honor God above all things? And do you trust in the mercy of Jesus? Let's pray together. God, this is your passion, the passion of the Christ. This is your love, the love of your son through the cross. The cross is foolishness to the perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God, the wisdom of God, the love of God. God, if we are going to be known for something, if there's a symbol of our faith, we praise you and thank you that it's the cross where your justice and your love collide that somehow it could be to our gain, that, that your loss, that, that your suffering could be to our benefit. God, that is your wisdom, your power, and your love. So God, I pray for each person, no matter where they find themselves this morning, God, that they would turn to you, that they would cry mercy, they would cry out for love and forgiveness. God, if there's any that came in with a mocking heart, a rebellious heart, heart that wants to give you the middle finger and slap you in the face. Oh God, that they would soften, soften to your cross, soften to the love, the blood that you shed because you wanted to communicate your love. God, 
God, these words don't adequately express our hearts, even as we sing these songs. God, hear, hear our hearts, hear our feelings, hear our thoughts about you, about what you've done in our lives. We worship you, Christ, crucified, buried, and risen. In Jesus' name, amen.